We start this morning with um, our uh, theme being the future business landscape between Finland and the rest of Europe and how it'll look with um, Steve Langdon, Regional Director EMEA of Parrot Analytics. Um, and uh, this is a New Zealand company, very well thought of, and he leads the EMEA region. Um, it's a company with a mission to help the, the power of TV content um, by capturing the world's largest TV audience behavior data set and applying it across the content lifecycle. He has over 18 years in the experience of running market development and consultancy within the broadcast corporation and video startups. Previously, he ran the international market development team for Comcast and built the global <coughs> strategic consultancy unit for Silicon Valley based on video startup called Uyala. He started his career by leading digital and uh, program operations for Foxtel in Australia and holds a master's in screen business in the Australian TV and film school. Um, so even with all of these credits, it doesn't really do justice to what he has in store for you today. Um, he, he, in dissecting the data by content in Nordics and, the fin and Finland's contributions, plus global content by genre and subgenre, how did the top Finnish shows do around the world, travelability of Nordic originals, and a deep dive into Netflix and Amazon scripted. So I'll take up no more of your time, Steve, over to you. Good morning. Thank you, Katrina, for that, that lovely introduction. Um, thanks to you and the team at Media Exchange. Great work that you're doing and um, looking forward to speaking today. Uh, my name's Steve. I am the Regional Director for EMEA, for Para Analytics, and I'm speaking to you from Sydney, Australia. Uh, and that's a story in itself, but uh, I won't go into that just at the moment. Let me see if I can share my screen. It might help. Okay, I trust you can see my screen. I'm sure you can. So we're going to talk about audience demand and the opportunity for content from Finland and indeed the Nordics. There is data today, I'm afraid. There is lots of data today, but don't panic because I'm an ex-TV person myself and I'm kind of gate crashing the data industry. So I'm going to explain it in business terms. This session is not about creativity because you guys, from what I read, you have that pretty much covered. Today is about the business of television in 2020, and it will hopefully open you up to new ways of looking at decisions that you make within your businesses. Now, production and commission in particular are tough nuts to crack with data, you know, because experience is what makes decisions right. So how can data possibly help you do that? Well, that's my challenge to show you today. The data being used today across the media industry to make decisions tends to be historical lagging indicators, like the ratings, like panels. Here, we work differently. We work on leading indicators. So we took some time out of our client work. I pulled in a couple of the insights directors to pull some exclusive data for this webinar and for you guys to help answer some questions or at least give you some data points to think about. So today is about leading indicators. Everybody loves a head start. I hope this may be yours. So let's start with a story because that of course is what television is all about. We're going to look at three different shows that premiered in Spain on the same network, Antenna 3. And we're going to look at how we spot global hits to give you an understanding of what we do here. So what you're looking at here are free show launches in Spain, the local market performances in 2017, 2018 and 2019. On the left hand side, you can see linear ratings for those three shows, Casa de Papel, Cati del Mar, and Matidero. Now from that, you can see that the marketing and promo teams, they've done a pretty good job. They've got people to watch the first episode of the show. But after that, there's no clear winner when it comes to which show was going to be a global phenomenon and which two shows were going to kind of disappear onto um, SVOD, SVOD catalogs. Let's overlay our metric. This is our metric called demand. 
Now I'll explain what demand is in a moment, but essentially you can see immediately that we have a clear differentiation. Cathy del Dalmar and Matadero, they kind of gathered um, initial, initial interest on our demand metric, but it kind of leveled off. Whereas we could see immediately there was exponential demand for the Casa de Papel, because not only do we measure local demand, we also measured demand from Spanish speaking territories around the world who were actually tuning in and hearing about this show to, um, to tune in. Now, what we could see after one year was that if you took demand into consideration, there was a clear winner. Money Heist, Casa de Papel was of course um, picked up by Netflix as part of a, as part of a deal. It was reformatted, it was um, changed and it was put into, uh, it briefly became our most in demand title worldwide earlier this year. Whereas the other two kind of disappeared into, um, into, into B catalog. Now, Casa de Papel is exactly what the international players want. They want growth engines and they want total available audience. But it does go deeper than that. Here's another example. This is a big show that you're all familiar with, um, Chernobyl. So you can see here that we measured out from premiere days all the 2019 HBO debuts, which are the red line, all the debuts full stop, which is the purple line, and Chernobyl itself. Now, 22 days out, you can see there is a glitch in demand for Chernobyl. It's a, it's a small glitch on this chart, but it's noticeable because what it means is that this show is going to over-index compared to the other shows. Now, Chernobyl was missed by its major broadcasters. They didn't realize how successful it was gonna be until it hit IMDB, until it became one of the most successful dramas of all time and before it really maintained its cultural conversation. So that's an, another example of a, of a leading indicator. So how do we do this? Well, we believe at, at Parrot that we live in an attention economy. Time is now the most valuable resource on the planet. You're giving me your time listening to this presentation when you could be doing something else, which I thank you for. If you're watching Disney, you're not watching Netflix. If you're watching Netflix, you're not watching Amazon Prime. Reed Hastings himself says we're competing for customers' time, so we're actually competing with sleep. We set out as a company to measure the time that people engage with television shows and to do it in a way that we could help solve some really big problems in the, um, in the television industry. Because we believe a 21st century content engagement metric is needed to truly understand what's going on in the new age of TV. Reed Hastings himself says subscriber numbers aren't the right metric to track his competition. And Disney and lots of other players won't share their ratings or their viewers for the original um, titles they've got, despite an industry push to do so. And in fact, we have some stars of uh, one of Apple TV Plus's shows come to us and ask us how her show was doing because she couldn't find out through Apple. So that's the reason why we're here. So this is what we do. I don't tell you this is a sales pitch so you can understand what's coming. So we capture over 2 billion people interacting with content online every day, about 3.5 billion signals. So we look at photo sharing sites, we look at video streaming sites, micro blogging, research, um, tubes, of course, social media, and piracy, which is a key part of what we do. We build all those signals together from every IP address uh, region around the world. Then we extract the signal from the noise. So if you like a show on Facebook, it's quite a passive impression. You're just kind of passing by. If you're encouraging other people to love the show, if you're actively researching or consuming the show, that's very heavy. We do this to create a content demand um, product and service that's available we look at all markets, so wherever there's an IP address, we're capturing demand for content in all languages, about 120 different languages. And we don't care whether a show is on RTL, TV One, BBC, Netflix or Disney. To us, a show is a show, and that is how we can index shows against each other. So that's briefly what demand is. Now, here are the questions that we set out to explore for this presentation after getting the brief. What is the current demand for content in the Nordics and how does it change from global trends? 
where indeed is there opportunity? What genres look like they can deliver incremental revenue for, for you guys as producers? How is the long tail currently um, valued by the international streamers? What's the what's the the state of long tail? How can we identify titles that retain viewers and the internationals really go after to reduce their uh, churn and keep subscribers on? How differently do the streamers think? How do your originals travel around the world compared to the Nordics and compared to other big countries? And how can we index television shows by market? So that's what we're going to look into in the next kind of 40 minutes. So let's first of all start with a macro study. Let's look at market trends and then look at how we identify white space. Now, two things I need to tell you. We're going to talk about demand expressions, which is basically a metric for the whole audience demand being expressed for a title. And the other one is demand expressions per capita, which is simply how we compare one country to another. So we essentially have a formula where we're able to take population into account. So we eliminate the fact that there's much more demand being generated in the US than there is in, say, Finland. So let's start with an easy one. If you take demand as 100% in the Nordics, then this is how people demand television shows. And we have 20,000 television shows that we gather demand on. So Sweden here has 37%. Sweden's pretty fascinating. Netflix has actually lost users in um, Sweden. If you look at the Nent group, they very cleverly had every window covered from post theatrical, pay-per-view, SVOD, AVOD, and even down to free to wear. Streaming is booming for them. It's up 31% year on year. Targets are already being revised up. And via play now represents 34% of the total group sales. A business transformation that's well in progress and having clear results. Netflix is steady in Sweden. They have a slight decrease due to uh, correction after the lockdown period. But 7% of the entire Swedish population added an SVOD in the last 12 months. And they subscribe to more than two services on average big nation for television content and demand. Norway is also punching there, but Finland, you guys are down at second bottom to Iceland. Now remember, we weight by population, so population does not have an impact here. True, we may not have every single local show in our database within Finland, but we track over 20,000 shows and we collect over, as I say, 3.5 billion signals a day. So this is a pretty robust data set. So Finland at the moment is, is lower in the region than we'd expect for, um, for demand. However, all this could be about to um, change. The Nordic Entertainment Group and uh, your L operator, Elisa have launched their combined streaming service and they'll launch it on December the 3rd. Um, partnership is all about taking streaming in Finland to the next level. We see considerable growth potential in Finland and we'll continue investing in content. We will realize our ambitions even faster. So what you've got are the companies joining together and really looking at powering even more content production. We see that around the world. We see operators, we see we see um, frenemies, we see people that didn't normally work together, now working together and combining content budget because it really is a big, a big budget game. So what's going on here? Let's have a look. So if we place the world view alongside Finland, how does it look? Well, here you can see if we can figure out locally what's working, that'll really help us, um, that'll really help us internationally. So you can see here that of all the demand globally, every single signal that we take in globally, this is how it currently looks. So drama takes 43.3%, comedy 15.2%, reality 95 and you can read the others yourself. Now, let's put Finland over the top. So you can see that drama is at 359 much less, much less when you consider a ratings point 
than the global average. Comedy, just about steady. Children over indexes significantly. Reality does pretty well. Animation um, over indexes as well. Let's put that another way. Drama is 0.8 of the global average. So all the countries that we look at is 0.8. Comedy is bang on. Children is 1.6, very high in Finland. Reality is 1.1. Animation and variety also over index. So let's break that down even further. Let's look at the differences in regional demand for content on a, on a genre level to look at the key overarching differences. So what you're seeing there is the main genre on the left hand side and in the countries at the top. So you can see clearly that there is higher demand for drama in Iceland, Norway and Sweden. So this genre would seem like an opportunity in Finland. There's not enough demand um, not the average in the region for, for drama. Now, children's content takes up a significantly higher share in Denmark and, um, and Finland as well. Now, you don't need to uh, take recordings of these slides. Uh, they are clear for you to um, take, take home and um, have a good look at afterwards. So there's no need to write anything down. You can have a copy of all these slides um, straight after the uh, presentation. If we then look at demand on a subgenre level, so now we've taken drama and we've broken it down into subgenres and really have a detailed look at what's going on here, we can now see that we uncovered a higher finished share for sci fi drama, animated sitcoms, preschool, and Japanese animation. So, sci fi drama is 6% of overall finished demand, higher than other Nordic markets, and animated sitcom, preschool, and animation all contribute a higher, higher share as well. So again, we take our data, we break it down and we break it down again so we can really kind of understand what is driving demand in each one of the countries that we look at all these signals in. Now, why do we do this? We do this to look at white space. We do this to help companies and producers understand what they should be producing or acquiring or packaging together that's really going to fire their audience up. This is a piece of analysis we did and it essentially shows here that for this country, the parents and kids, there was much more demand for content than there was supply. That's that grey part there. So they could clearly see that they needed to do something about the parents and kids demo because it was an opportunity that was going begging compared to the supply on other channels. So that is why we do these kind of analysis to really help companies understand what needs to, um, where the gaps are and how they can, how they can fill the gaps. I hope that makes sense. So let's have a look now at what content we should be creating or what content is being created at the moment because tent poles versus long tails is a big debate going on in the industry at the moment everyone's looking at tent poles but the long tail is making um making a bit of a a bit of a comeback let me explain tent poles dominate the news so you know the boys was more popular than netflix's umbrella academy whatever popular means um, Money Heist became the most in-demand show in the world and The Last Dance, which was the uh, pretty amazing sports documentary released uh, um, by ESPN and Netflix during um, the initial lockdowns, overtook Tiger King as the world's top documentary. So ten poles are where the news is at. Uh, they're also where the budgets are at. So phones cost a huge amount of money, Amazon are spending a pretty ridiculous sum of money on uh, the Lord of the Rings deal because they know um, what, it can, what it can drive for their overall business. And a Mandalorian cost 100 million um, to make, but of course that's the key acquisition driver for our friends down at Disney Plus. So Tempoles is making television becoming a bit blockbuster dominated, like the movies were as well, like the movies still are. So you can see if we look at Tempoles, now we call Tempoles the top 20% of what we look at. So we've got, the 80-20 rule. So tempos have grown. So the way to read that is in 2020, 80, sorry, 2019, 
of all demand that we saw comes from temp poles and long tails was about 23%, 18 and then 17. So there's no doubt about it that temp poles drive demand. However, what's happening now is that the long tail is really kicking in, particularly this year, as we've seen more and more um, people burn through new shows, the long tail, the content supply is going right up and we're seeing about 1700 shows a year that are being, um, that are being created. So 10 poles drive up the average of the entire catalog. So if Stranger Things drives you to Netflix, obviously you hang around for, uh, for more Netflix, active customers drive down churn. But every time HBO Max spend another million, it accumulates what they have in their library already. It's incremental. So consumers now get access to shows from 2020, 2021, 2022, and the value of the service grows in their mind. So there's no licensing, global ownership. It's all about the uh, retention of subscribers. And then they look for shows outside of Tentpon that's really gonna drive their perceived gaps and attract more um more audience so the more they add to their library the more the catalog value to a subscriber grows and what we've seen is the average demand for long tail shows has been growing every year particularly this year because what we've seen during the lockdowns is that people have been burning through all their tent pole shows and the deep catalogs are where everyone is heading to so folks like apple are now actually looking at beyond their originals and thinking, how do we get packages of content? How do we um, get multi-episode shows that are really gonna drive extended viewing? So long tail is having, is having a moment. And I believe that it's essentially where it's at. You know, tent poles are gonna drive acquisition, but it's a long tail that's gonna keep you on catalog. So even though all of you may not be producing blockbusters, it's massively in demand what you're doing. So let's have a look at how we use our piracy data to look at what viewers of the finished shows that um, we were given as examples um, are, also, uh, are also viewed alongside. Now, the way we do this, this looks really complicated, but in fact, essentially it's a global recommendations engine. We look at a piece of content and then look at the size of audience in common between that piece of content and another piece of content. So the more audience in common, the more affinity. So we use our piracy data to understand this. So we can go away from closed circuit. If you watch this on Viaplay, you'll also like this on Viaplay and more worldwide. If you like watching this, you're also watching this. Let's make it real for you. So, uh, so Jean, we can understand exactly what other shows were being viewed. I think this is year to date. So the original TV network was TV one, the genre, you can see the network, the IMDB rating. These are the actual shows that people are pirating alongside this show. Dad's Army is an interesting one. Line of Duty makes sense. Homeland kind of makes sense. Deadwind is great because that's also from you guys. So that's, um, that's, a, that's a result that people are watching that and then watching that. And Lucifer's there as well. There's Deadwind there, 7.2 on IMDb. And you can see that Dark's been watched, which is a very niche title. So that's an interesting one. Line of Duty, you've got a crossover there. The Umbrella Academy, uh, The Boys, uh, Most Dangerous Game. And then Cold Courage, that Viaplay original, you can see there that, you know, you've got another crossover with Dark, Little Fires Everywhere, Endeavor and, and Stateless, and also Wentworth from... Uh, from where I am, from, uh, from Australia. So you can really start to understand what people view, but why do you do that? Well, the reason you do that is that shows that are proven to lead to other shows on the same network are very valuable. So here you can see Netflix, 40% of the top 25 titles that people pirate alongside The Witcher are also on Netflix, great retention title. The morning show, four out of 25, not Apple's best result, probably, but you could argue that's what they're looking for. Just keep, all, keep people ticking over while they sell hardware. And The Mandalorian has an issue. Zero percent, when we looked at it, of the top 25 titles that were pirated alongside The Mandalorian were also on Disney+. Plus. Indeed, here they are. Number one was The Boys on Amazon Prime Video. 
So you can imagine how pleased they are about that. So this really shows that it is very key to have acquisition titles, but it's really key to have retention titles. You're filling a gap with your shows. This is how the internationals figure out where that gap is. The title's in red there. You can launch on your platform, but you're gonna have to really work hard in marketing to get them to push through because they're low demand and, um, and, uh, and low retention. Whereas the ones in the green box, they're great. They're the ones that you want at the end, outside of your credit reels, your promos, your inside show promos. They're the ones that drive people to watch another show on the same, um, on the same, same service. So they're extremely valuable. And then the ones that you stick outside Central Station, there's the ones in the orange box there. They're the ones that are gonna drive people to come onto your platform for acquisition. Now, the way these guys work is by verticals and taste clusters. They're not, they don't work so much about demographics. So Netflix calls these groupings verticals. So they're very specific genres of film and TV, um, such as young adult comedies. Traditional networks that aim for broad audiences obviously try and fill their schedules with shows from multiple categories. What's different at the internationals is they try and fill so many of these categories with content. So they look at the, the content as itself, but then they look at it, how well it performs across multiple verticals. So how many groups of people they can, they can hit. Now we also look at that when we do, they look at taste classes rather than demographics, because you may be 75 and into Game of Thrones, or you may be 16 and into Game of Thrones. So it really is about looking at the individual taste clusters, which is how they make their decisions on content. So it's good to start thinking the way that they think. They even look at, um, we can even look at social media. So this is 3.7 thousand followers of The Great on Twitter. There's an unengaged um, Twitter universe there outside of that account of 1.3 million. We can actually see what content people are viewing alongside the great, what brands they're into, what talent and influencers and what conversation drivers to build out these taste clusters. So you can see here that 11% taste cluster here is reality and romance. So this audience segment shows a high affinity with romance, drama, musicals, and Hollywood. Really just trying to show you the different ways that the internationals look at a show because it's very different. Um, Story first format definitely uh, follows when you deal with the um, when you deal with the uh, the new guys. They're all about local noise. How can they launch? Um, how can they acquire viewers locally? But really about global appeal. How they can go international with uh, with a big show. It's really key for you guys to understand their markets, understand their launch strategy. If they're not in an area yet, look at their individual gaps by doing kind of analysis and their strengths, and then try and think how how they think is a good way of, uh, of getting into them. So what are the subgenres and themes that are being demanded? So each quadrant here shows the performance of a subgenre in your region, uncovering opportunities and potential areas that we can explore. And I'll take you through those now. So top left, you've got potential. So you've got shows, you've got subgenres here that if you increase the supply, and maintain the demand. So you're looking at producing more, acquiring more, uh, you can see procedural drama there as an example, whilst maintaining the quality of, of output. That's very strong potential. So you may, may want to consider producing in those, in those areas. Those are the areas that there's definitely space in demand. Uh, you've got underperforming titles here. So genres that we understand globally, which titles resonate and, um, and travel well. These, these underperforming ones could move to strong performing if there's more, more awareness around them, or we look at what regions they work better than, than others. So those are the underperformings that could move to strong performings. This is a saturated category. So there are new commissions here within subgenres that already exist. You can still make them, but you're gonna have to fight to get them to cut through because there's a lot of competition and there's a lot of higher marketing costs. And if you zoom in there, you can see um, subgenres. there's opportunities for content such as late night talk shows there, survival reality and, and sports documentary, which is uh, unscripted, but it gives you an idea of how we look at opportunities. So how do 
Finnish originals travel around the world is probably a key question. Let me show you how we analyze that. We use a metric called travelability. Now, travelability simply looks at titles that resonate globally. It's basically the level of demand for a show at a specific point in time benchmarked against its home market. Essentially, it allows us to see which shows travel better or worse than how they perform demand wise in their home market. And it's a very important metric that um, sales teams use um, and marketing teams use to really understand how um, how they should prioritize their um, their titles. So here's how those three titles that we looked at, Cold Courage, Carpe and Sojourn, and excuse pronunciation, traveled around the world. So each one of those percentages is against the average. So against the average country, Russia saw a 451% travelability for Carpe, very, very strong in Russia. Now you guys may be familiar with that, you may not be familiar with that, but what our travelability ranking does is it allows us to really look deeply into these titles and understand which areas of the world show very high affinity to the show. Now you've got to remember that the show may not have been officially released in these territories, okay? Even though The Mandalorian was only released in the US and the Netherlands, we, we sure as hell saw demand for it all over the world where people were pirating it and talking about it. So what our metric does is it allows like um, distribution teams to look at opportunities for content that maybe haven't had a monetization window yet and then look at getting it out there. So I'll let you look at this at your leisure, but that's, um, that's how those three titles travel. Now, another way of looking at this is this. The, all the countries are, um, around the world that we cover are on the, the bottom axis, axis here. And you can see that cold courage, the median travelability is, is, um, is 6%. You can see the home market demand is always 100% there. Finland. So anything above that 100% means that cold courage is traveling better to that territory than it is um, in its home territory. So it's becoming international, as you know, because it was um, it was signed by Viaplay. Now, Brazil, I welcome comments from you guys about why Brazil was so high for cold courage. We have looked at the data. We've tried to break it. We've tried to look at it as a... Um, uh, as an error, but it looks correct from our point of view. We see South America with very high um, travelability for cold courage. Here's the three titles together, and I can send you the breakdowns of these if you're really interested. You can see that Carpi essentially shows the highest travelability with an average of 24% in comparison to the other two titles. So this really gives us an opportunity to look at a title and understand what is the potential for that title to go international? And as I say, it's a leading indicator because even though the show may not have been released, we can still track and see whether it's going to um, go international. So all three of those titles that we picked out for this session, they definitely went, um, they definitely went international, as you can see. So if we take all Nordic originals and we look at the travelability of them, this is all the Nordic originals we've got in our database at the moment. You can see that the top category you want to get to is, is the top right. You want to get to high travelability and high home demand. And you can see, you know, I'm sure you guys can take far more insight from that knowing your market than, um, than I can, but you can see the familiar titles in there. And you can see some that you'd expect to have high travelability like, um, like Lego and uh, angry, angry Birds. Now the ones on the top left, they're the ones that don't travel quite as well, but they've got very strong home demand. Those are the ones that, you know, you want to double down on your internal marketing, make sure you've got your monetization windows covered in, in your internal uh, country, but you probably aren't gonna travel quite as much. And the ones you wanna avoid are the ones with low demand home and low travelability. Those are the ones that probably, uh, uh, would struggle to get a, uh, a second series or a, or a franchise. So again, I'll let you have a look at that in your own leisure time. We pulled that data for you exclusively. Finally, because I've probably blown your minds by now, I wanted to have a look at demand and index by individual uh, market. 
So what we've done here is we took we took all demand for Nordic content and we broke out the top um, the top 35. And you can see each country along the top and you can see a rank and an index. So the way to read this is that exhibition, exhibition Robinson from Sweden has a rank of one, but it over indexes in Sweden by 28 times the average survival reality show. So this shows even though it's high in demand, it also shows the index. So from there, you can see that in Norway, it ranks 35 and it indexes only very, very slightly above the average survival reality. So a very, very clear difference, as you'd expect, because it's a it's a Swedish show. But you can see in Iceland, it actually ranks 112 and is, and is bang on average. So again, I'll let you um, I'll let you take these away and have a look into these um, yourselves. But uh, Rita is from Denmark is a really good example here. You can see how it ranks and indexes in its own country, yet it doesn't really pop anywhere else. So there's dramatic differences in how we look at shows um, in demand that rank in, in countries around, but also how they index. Now we've also done that for you for Netflix scripted content so you can assess how Netflix content travels around your region as well. So you can see there that The Witcher is, is absolutely massive in um, uh, all the way around the region, 31 times the average demand in uh, Sweden, 26% in uh, Norway, 20, um, tw 20 times the average demand in, uh, in Denmark. You can see strong results for the crown in Sweden, which also makes makes sense there, but across the region. And there's some really interesting results like sex education popping in uh, in Sweden as well. And orange is the, is the new black. And I think Cobra Kai was an interesting one as well because it kind of pops in, uh, in Iceland. So you can have a look through that. That's basically the top 35 on Netflix scripted, broken down by region for you. And finally, the guys did, uh, or not finally, they did unscripted content, just so you can look at the difference between unscripted. Unscripted, we're seeing huge, huge commissions at the moment around the world in uh, unscripted. It does seem to be the, the next big thing. Of course, um, Discovery have launched, their, launched a global service. There's lots of different documentary services, and there's some very cool breakout um, titles this year. Documentaries are specifically looked at as gateways into services. So some shows uh, are made to draw in mass audience, like a mass audience documentary, but then they're meant to dive into niches after that. So again, these kind of like niches and, um, and the, the hardcore shows. Um, and then we've done Amazon content for you as well, just as a little bonus. So you can see the demand for Amazon content you can compare Jack Ryan to uh, our man in Japan and the expanse so those three slides really will give you an understanding of how how shows are um are, are ranking and indexing in each one of the uh, countries I hope it gives you an understanding of how how the demand differs around so we go back to the questions at the top what is the current demand for content in the Nordics and how does it differ? Well, you can see that from the start of the deck, we've actually gone into um, the global trends, had a look at the global demand and then broken down the current demand for content in the Nordics and also Finland specifically. So you can see where we believe the opportunities are there. Uh, we've looked at what genres are best suited to deliver that incremental um, revenue. You've got several charts in here where you can really dig in and have a look at our, our data to have a look at what genres um, look like they will be good to double down on. Of course, you don't just use our data to do this. You use your gut instinct, you use uh, your boss's gut, gut instinct, you use your experience, you use what you know about your region, but the data gives you an extra, extra angle. Uh, we looked at long tail and how it's valued by the international streamers. We know that it's really, really important and it's becoming even more important that these streamers have um, titles that are used to retain their viewers and reduce their churn, which is a key metric in the new world of television. Uh, we've looked at how differently the streamers think 
and adapting to their thinking through verticals and through taste clusters. You can take another look through that. We looked at how Finnish originals, those three Finnish originals traveled around the world to understand how we can take a show and really look at how it's perceived around the world before we look at international um, strategy. And we've also looked at rank and demand of um, on shows as well with those bonus slides that we did for you at the end. We help media companies make smarter decisions. We're in all areas of, um, of media. And you can see from there what we do. And if you're really interested in being able to compare shows to shows, we've kind of democratized the access to our data. Um, for, you know, we get the complaint occasionally that we're, um, we're enterprise only and people would love to use our data. We have a product called Monitor that you're essentially able to, um, to sign up for. I think it's about 59 US a month. It has all of our um, industry analysis. It has all of our global market analysis and you're able to index shows from every territory against other territories. So feel free to have a look at that. Uh, look, that was whistle stop, that was 40 minutes. I know there was a lot in there. Um, I hope it wasn't too mind blowing. And I hope above all, it's encouraged you to think a little bit differently at how you look at um, your content. Thank you very much. Steve, that's absolutely brilliant. I mean, uh, it is, as you say, completely mind-boggling looking at um, all of those statistics and, <laughs> and what they inform. So thank you for staying up late to do that. I, I have a cheeky question from somebody who goes anonymous and that's saying, are you working on the US election? <laughs> uh, we're not working on the US election, but we did do a piece of work. Um, when was it? I believe it was a couple of years ago for another big vote where we looked at what television content was more in demand by whether you voted Britain to be in Europe or out of Europe. And there were some very interesting results there. So we do dig into some fun stuff like that, but we're not working on the US election, um, but I'm looking forward to uh, watching what goes on tomorrow. Okay, so we, we do ha we have a serious question for you, which okay. is um, how do you work out you know what what I guess the matrix for for um, pirating? Um, okay, yeah, so piracy is a very interesting one. So what we do is as soon as a show gets put on a piracy search engine, we take a copy of that file name. We then are able to take that file name and look at how many people seed it and leech it all the way around the world. Now we have about 300 million different endpoints. We don't, we can identify them by obviously like uh, anonymously. We don't do it for enforcement. We only do it to kind of show the industry there's a new way of looking at piracy, a more positive way of looking at the amount of shows that get, um, that get pirated. For example, there's a big show in Britain called Normal People, which I'm sure you're familiar with. It was launched on uh, BBC America and the BBC. Uh, there, were, there was massive piracy in uh, Europe. And we showed a couple of people that that was the missed monetization. If they'd released day and date, we believe some of that piracy could have been converted into, uh, into money. And that is, the, uh, that is what we use piracy for. Uh, if anyone's talking, they're on mute. Thanks, Steve. Sorry. Yeah, I'm back again. Um, Steve, we were asking from Tanya, uh, do you have any figures for HBO Nordic? Uh, we, we do have figures for show. So how we, how we look at platform is we essentially take our demand metric and then we we understand what where shows are currently being windowed to look at platform metrics. So yes, we do have stats on HBO Nordic. So there weren't any in that presentation, but 
if Tanya wants to uh, write to me and tell me what she would uh, she's after, I'll uh, I'll see if one of the lads can help out. Okay, one last 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 question. Um, how come animation shows were listed under unscripted instead of scripted content in the demand for Netflix slides? I believe some animations are listed as uns. Mm, that's a good. That's a, that's a really good question. It could have been. It could have been an error, Terry. I'll um, I'll check it out. I'll check out that slide. Yeah, the uh, animations are definitely scripted. Uh, do you want? Do you want one more question, or you want to go? No, I can do one more question. It's happy. Okay, from Marku, he says you mentioned that first story, then format. What about cast? Oh, cast is a really interesting one. Yeah, thanks for mentioning it. Cast is, we work with the creative artist agency over in uh, um, America, and we have about 8,000 talent that we also gather information on. And what they use that information for is to understand what talent suits what show, suits what country, according to what goals they're, they're looking at. We've done a really cool piece of work um, a very important piece of work on diversity and how diverse productions have been growing significantly in the last um, 18 to 24 months. It's, um, it's paywalled, but I will send that out to everyone because it's a really interesting use of how we use our talent information. And it's a critical conversation that we're having at Parrot to help the industry with diversity. Uh, Steve, I think we, we must let you go, but I'm um, just incredibly grateful for the, the you know, special care that you, you um, put in for um, us uh, in Finland. Um, many, many thanks and looking forward to sharing the deck with our uh, group and, you know, uh, have a good night. Yeah, that's fine. So we'll, I'll, I'll send the, the deck so you can take it. If you've got any more questions, please do ask them on, uh, on email and uh, I'll come back to you. I hope you all enjoy the, uh, the, rest of the, um, the rest of the course. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Steve. Thanks.